is um, this is a blueprint of uh, the uh, of one of the signs. That's the sign when Roger Moore goes through the military base. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. And it I says know. "Stop at the barrier," yeah. Yeah. and he walks past it. So this is an original blueprint from um, from Octopussy. Yeah. The Living Daylights here, 1986, and then it says Eon Productions, Prop Department, I don't know where. Hello Bond fans, once again a fan celebration and we're in Frankfurt. Actually, we're over the roofs of Frankfurt and with John Glenn, five-time Bond director. John! Don't step backwards. <laughs> high above Frankfurt? I won't. No, no. High above Frankfurt? How do you feel? I feel a bit giddy, actually. It's quite high here, isn't it? <laughs> no barriers? No. No, it's not for the faint-hearted. No. Yeah. Definitely not. And once more, please. Yeah. I can. You and I would spend. Did you take it? Yes. You did all this. Did you plan it all? Did you have an architect or? Yeah. Oh, you're the architect. Okay, fair enough. It's my home for my family. Yes, exactly. So you planned it all, and yeah, yeah. Sorry guys, but it's the best spot here somehow. Yeah. It's the best skyline in Offerbach here. It is, it's gorgeous. Painted today, whatever trick she is. And the way we got the, um, the way we got the plane to, to get out of the way, that was a model. That was a model. Yes. Big model. We went down on two wires. Yeah. Went down on two wires through the wingtips, and to get the plane to go over the angle, all we did was release the tension on one of the, the wings. It went like that. It's simple. Yeah, very simple. Very simple. Because I thought maybe because it was a rival film, you would uh, want uh, to skip this, this was quite interesting. We, went, we shot this in Iceland. In Iceland, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a very good scene. We had the motor, motorized iceberg. This one here, yeah. 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 This one, yeah. Oh, this was on the Alpha Towers. <laughs> Cheers. It's not, it's not a drink, you know why? Do you know why it's not a drink? About, uh, let me show you. I think he has an aversion. No, you don't? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? Nice to meet you again. Yeah, yeah, same here. Yeah. Well, hope I'm not getting in your car. No, no, you, you don't have to get. It's a you, funny story. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, what a funny story. It's very funny because we, we escaped and we are fine. Funny like ha ha. Yeah. So, very funny. the story goes, we were in Chateau Volivicont for the Moonraker event of the Club James Bond France. And I had the misfortune to get into his car after a couple of drinks. Yeah. Uh, not, not Me, not him. No. And we were stopped by the... French police. Le gendarmerie. Uh, yeah, le gendarmerie. Oui. Uh, because when when the arrow points your way, you're probably wrong. Yeah, that's true. You're wrong. I not, was not very me. wrong. No, you, you were just you. a bystander. It was very stupid of me. I was mine. a bystander. S sitting. I was very tired. I was a we sitting bystander. Very busy day. Bombing. Photo bombing again. <laughs> <laughs> but a very busy day, and uh, I drove the wrong direction on the bridge. And there they were, and it was my birthday, that was also very funny. And they were pointing two machine guns at us. That's a super Yeah, that was the part that you don't like, I think. Ah, because it's a bit over-exaggerated, they weren't pointing machine guns at us. The way I remember it is, I, I, I got a little bit scared, because French uh, policemen and machine guns, you know. Mm. And I said, you're, you're, stop the car, they've got a machine gun. I did. That's what I said, and he stopped the car mm. right away. And they were busy with somebody else, yeah. actually, who was 
quite literally speeding probably oh, over yeah. the bridge. So we were nobody. But he looked at his plates, Dutch plates. You know and, what and you, does he say? Yeah? Before he came to, he, and he came to my side. Is, is not even to the driver's no. side. He came to my side no. and and did like. Like, like you actually had a car where you still have a lever, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, you know? And, and, and I just uh, he said, did you take any drugs, any alcohol? No. And I said, no, <laughs> no. I didn't either. And I, I, I pulled myself together to seem normal, yeah. but I did not drink anything. No. So he should have pulled himself together. Mm -hmm. And you didn't drink anything. Yeah, no, this is cool, yeah, because I'm still with the car. But it was fun. It was yeah, fun. It was so, it was so crazy fun. because I, he didn't ask for the papers. I had to ask him, do you want the papers? Yeah, no, no. He, he saw the Dutch number plates and thought, F it. Yeah. And then they checked the, the, the Umwaldplatte, as you call oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's okay. Probably then not you can in go French. On. That was it. Yeah. And it was a crazy birthday. Yeah, that was our story. Well, let's let's go back to John Glenn. We survived. John Glenn has got much more interesting stories to tell. Than oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hope you like it anyway. <laughs> it's like the big reveal, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oh, the Bond bulletin, hello. And you again? Yeah, yeah. Nice to see you again, Mr. Bond. Oh, James Bond, Netherlands. Yeah, nice once trends. again, once again. Get out of my way. Oh, sorry. That's good. Yeah. 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 Oh my god, it's crazy, what's going on? This is so great! Alright, what's up? Uh, it's good to know where it is. It's real long legs, please. Yeah. Oh! Oh my god. Will it go? Is that over there? Beach. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not if you have a large family.
as elegantly as possible. <laughs> Not bad. We got here anyway. Whether we'll ever get home again is <laughs> These people have come just for you. John Glenn is here. Jeder mit Herrn Nivea. Ich habe mich gerade im Spiel. Ja, gut, gut. John Glenn als Regisseur von Vitenz zu töten, ist natürlich die Top-Wahl für 30 Jahre, die dieser Film feiert. Und das Deutsche Filmmuseum als Location dafür, da ist den Film im Archiv als Film mal gewählt. Und John Glenn ist einfach jemand, der seine Fans liebt. Wie sind die Erwartungen für No Time to Die? Das ist Ihre persönliche Einschätzung? Sie haben ja viel verfolgt, wer war in Also meine persönliche, ich nenne es Hoffnung, ist, dass wir einen sehr gut balancierten action blockbuster bekommen, der über zwei Stunden wieder das liefert, was Roger Moore immer gesagt hat. Zwei Stunden Action, Spaß, Humor, Unterhaltung. Mit dem Gefühl möchte ich ins Kino und aus dem Kino raus. Ich möchte nicht enttäuscht sein. Kein Fan möchte enttäuscht sein. Ähm, natürlich ist so eine bond ein riesengroßes Fass. Ähm, und niemals kann man das jedem recht geben. Aber ich habe schon hohe Erwartungen, auch an den Regisseur Harry Fukunaga. Was man bisher gesehen hat von den Dreharbeiten, das macht mich schon heiß. Das stimmt. Also da ist was. Der wird gut. Thank you. I work. No. Are you good at skiing? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. John Glenn and um, and his wife Janine. It's wonderful to have you here. Is it on? All right, that's better. Welcome to John Glenn and to his wife Janine, who have joined us today here at the DFF, Deutsches Film please. Institute and Film part. Museum. Please be comfortable. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Ellen Harrington. I'm the director here. And I only want to say very briefly welcome. I'll be conducting the conversation with Mr. Glenn in the theater, which is a great honor for me. And I really want to thank the James Bond Club and um, Andreas Pott and his group of enthusiastic fans. It's exciting to have you here. And also to have um, Michael Kampf from uh, Universal um, Germany, which now has the rights. And we're hoping we can have some wonderful activities around the release of the new film next spring. So um, I also want to thank the Freunde des AFF, our wonderful friends. And I'm going to hand the microphone to the president of our friends and supporters group, Margot Muller. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> John, it's such an honor to have you here. We are all moved and we thank you so much because, as I may say, you're no longer 17 nor 15. <laughs> so it's, it's really great you, took, you, you came to us and that you're here tonight because everybody is so enthusiastic. And you sit there and you write all the autographs. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> we made so many years ago um, are still shown to millions of people who appreciate 
the work we had doing what we loved doing, making people excited, making them laugh, taking them out of their mundane lives sometimes. It's such a wonderful opportunity to do that. And I feel very privileged and I'm very grateful for you guys that you still love my movies. <laughs> so I'd like to hand this over to Andreas. Here we are. Yeah. And thank you all, all the people who organise this, and it's a wonderful museum. I'm looking forward to seeing it again one day. I just <laughs> right I'm still you. around when they show my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, John and Gam. And an official welcome to you to the museum here in Frankfurt and uh, an official welcome from the James Bond Club to you and to me for having us. We are very glad to have you here. I don't want to make so much words now because we have something with much better than words and this is music, music of you, James Bond films, John, and with a little musical tribute we like to begin our evening of License to Kill, and so I am very proud and glad to introduce our special guest tonight. This is Mike Garden, Lady Bond. Yeah. <laughs>
Because in the in the original song, she used to sing "License to Kilt." He <laughs> <laughs> thought it was a reference to Sean Connery, <laughs> the Scotsman. I don't know, but uh, uh, we kept listening to her. We thought, I can't believe that she did not say "kilt." She said oh "kilt." <laughs> so I'm glad, I'm glad you put it right. <laughs> Mr. Glenn, <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, it's a great honor for me to sing for you, Mr. Glenn and yeah. Mrs. Glenn, <laughs> and everybody here. So, um, yes, cheers. <laughs> cheers yeah. on a fantastic evening. <laughs> We're 30 years of license to kill. Have you got yeah. a sect for me, or water is a sect, champagne? So let's. Anybody can. Uh, <laughs> oh, you deserve a whole bottle. <laughs> Maybe. So cheers. 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 Are you excited? <laughs> to find out who comes after Daniel Craig. Of course. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Developing, um, developing my pro program with all Bond songs and all films with their characters. I'm dreaming that after Daniel Craig, there will be a Lady Bond. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> And the theme for her, I have already written. Oh. <laughs> so let's start. <laughs> Especially for you tonight. <laughs>
you so much for being here and joining us. John Glenn. Yeah, John. John Glenn. Thank you for being here. here and it is my privilege and honor to welcome our special guest for the night, Mr. John Glenn. Yeah. John is such an excellent storyteller, there's almost nothing that I have to do. But I want first to really thank the James Bond Club and particularly Andreas Pott, who organized um, the group that came here tonight, and Lady Bond. Uh, it's really awesome to have you with us. And I also really want to thank the Freunde, this DFF, and Margot Muller specifically. Um, and also to let you guys know that tonight is really special because after we have the conversation, the film print you're going to see is from our own archive in 35 millimeter, and it's spectacular. So, uh, something to look forward to after the conversation. So, um, we were talking in my office very briefly about getting your start, and you've had such a fascinating career, and it may have developed very differently if you were a young filmmaker today. Um, would you tell us a little bit about what it was like to start um, in the studio as a messenger boy, essentially, and to learn all of these crafts, all of these, you know, what we now call below-the-line crafts from the masters of English cinema in these decades that you were, a, you know, a young professional? How much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> as I say, I was 14 years of, a, of age and I just left school. Um, and uh, I always remember I got on my bicycle and I cycled to Nettlefold Studios where I'd heard there was a vacancy for a page boy. And I uh, went to see the commissioner there and he said, um, sorry son, he said, you're too tall. He's for the uniform. So he said, but I'll, I'll ring Shepherd Studios. It's a much bigger studio and they probably might have you know, a job for you. So I Continued cycled over from Nettlevold Studios at uh, Walton on Thames to Shepparton Studios, where Sir Alexander Calder was making his films. And I got as far as the gate and the gateman, 
took, I didn't have, we didn't have a telephone, quite honestly. We didn't have telephones in those days, so they were a bit of a luxury. Uh, and I left my name and address, and shortly afterwards, about two or three weeks later, I got an interview as a messenger boy, which I got the job. So I joined about 20 other messenger boys, um, going around the studio with works orders to the various departments. And uh, the chap who was showing me the ropes, he said, don't bother with that. that, they never look at and put them down the drain, you know, so I was being taught by this chap who knew a few things and he taught me to be very selective on where I put these works orders. I didn't take too much notice of it, fortunately. I got a junior job numbering the film and doing all the mundane uh, jobs you do as a junior in the editing rooms, which included getting rid of um, surplus nitrate film, which was extremely uh, flammable. And I remember that uh, a, f a friend of mine, John Lee and myself, nearly set fire to the Shepherd Studios, bur burning nitrate film out on the lot. It was a windy day and we started a fire, a grass fire, and we were really panicked. We were trying to beat this thing out with sacks and eventually we did manage to contain the fire. but. Uh, it shows you how dangerous working in the cutting room was because the film was so so um, flammable and um, on the third man where I had the junior, I was a junior assistant on the third man and Oswald Hatton Richter, the editor, he draped his celluloid of his film, the third man, over the, the sound head of the movieola which gets very hot, it's got an exciter lamp inside and he went off and had lunch, uh, dinner in the evening. And of course, while he was away, the, the film got very hot and eventually exploded and set the, set the cutting rooms on fire. Um, apparently, I heard later that Oswald, who, who was a, a refugee from Austria somewhere, and um, he had this, um, this old coat, which was a, we all used to joke about, this stuff, terrible old coat, which he'd got in grass or somewhere. And uh, he beat, went past the fireman and forced his way into the cutting room and didn't come out with the film. He came out with this old coat which was smouldering, <laughs> which was so dear to him. So then we had to then, uh, we had to reprint like three quarters of the film. And uh, he employed every editor in the business to, to make the original dates for the third man. Fortunately, the negative was at the laboratory miles away. And, uh, and I earned a comparative fortune because I was the numbering boy. I had to number all these reprints and I was, never mind about child working hours, I, I was there practically half the night on overtime working for, um, you know, to, to print all these, uh, number all these rushes. Mm -hmm. So we used to number the films in synchronization for the editors. And uh, anyway, uh, Carol Reed came in with a crate of beer one night he was a very nice man, and uh, it, you know I learned a lot about uh, about what can happen in the cutting room, and to be careful about <laughs> nitrate film because it was dangerous. So, as your editing career developed, there was an opportunity to start being in the company of the people who were making the Bond films. And how did you end up with your first um, assignment in the editing team on um, the Bond series? Well, Pete, Peter Hunt was the editor on the early Bond films, and he was very talented, and he devised a sort of a, a, a new way of editing. I mean, he absolutely revo revolutionized uh, the editing process in a sense. You know, uh, Sean Connery would look towards the door, next minute he's in the corridor walking down. I mean, English films at that stage, they would follow the person all the way to the door, bore the, bore the audience, you know, and walk them down the corridor. He, he and Terence uh, Young devised this system. It was like a short, shortcut, you know. Uh, it was a style, uh, abbreviated style of editing. And uh, I admired it very much, what I saw, because it was very strange. And Peter, Peter, of course, he edited all those early Bond films, which were a huge success. Um, he, he was a, a friend of mine, and he said to me, he said, when uh, Dr. No opened, uh, there was a press show, and uh, he said, Terence Young came, as directors do, they stand at the back of the auditorium, and they try and gauge whether the film's working or not, or whether all those decisions they made are okay. 
he said that the, the press all started laughing at the film and Terence Young had made a straight thriller and when they started laughing he got terribly embarrassed and he walked out the theatre and he walked home and he went home and uh, Peter said when uh, the, the reviews came out that, that evening in the, all the evening papers uh, he rang Terence Young and he said Terence you better go out and get the papers because they're raving about this new style of the filming, the James Bond films, you know, the, the humour and the, you know, it was just a fantastic revolution in filmmaking for in, in England. And Terence said, oh, that's all very well, he said, but how am I going to do the second one? <laughs> now knowing what I know. <laughs> so you can say that, in a way, that the whole Bond thing started almost as an accident, you know, because Terence made a very serious thriller for a million dollars. Went ten, ten, uh, went ten percent over schedule, uh, over budget. So he was a bit of a bad boy. And when you compare it today, what did they cost today? Two hundred and fifty, three hundred million dollars. <laughs> so from the time of editing or being, you know, in in the um, the team, you got to know the Broccoli's and Michael Wilson, which became a long time family fam friendship in a way, and a long relationship. Um, so, um, how how do you look back on that time? Um, you know, as this group, creative group was developing, you were working with Ken Adam, um, many other legendary people in these you know creative um, roles in production design and um, you know uh, the cameraman. So, um, yeah, how do you know uh, what's your, what's your as you look back on on that time in that creative family of people who came back you know film after film, what is the strongest you know yeah, well, memory you have about that? I suppose I was very fortunate because Peter Hunt, who uh, I've talked about, um, he he eventually got the break to to uh, direct on Her Majesty's Secret Service, and it was a huge break for him. And uh, he set up a second unit to do all that snow stuff. And they had the worst winter. There was no snow, uh, and uh, the unit went, you know, went crazy up there in the mountains. And you know, and then they started the snow. And then, of course, it, it, it became like imperative to do the snow scenes quickly. And uh, the Bob Run was the big action sequence of the film. And I got a call from Peter Hunt, quite surprisingly. I was working on the doing a filling job on the Italian job and the phone rang in the theatre at Twickenham and uh, they said, oh, it's fine with her on the phone, uh, can you ring Peter Hunt? So I went out and called, called Peter and uh, he said, get your ass to, back to, down to Shepparton and uh, as fast as you can and when I got down there he opened up the script and he said, read that scene, which was the Bob Run sequence and he said, uh, how would you like to direct it? And I couldn't really believe what was happening. And the following Monday, I was on a plane flying first class to Switzerland <laughs> to a whole new career, if you like. It, it, Peter had been watching my career the same way as I've been watching his career. And whereas mine was mainly on television, uh, film television series like The Prisoner and Danger Man and all that stuff. Um, and uh, that's where I really got my experience of second unit directing. And uh, then, of course, I made a big success of doing my bit on the Majesty's Secret Service. I took over the, the entire action stuff on the film and, uh, and finished up editing the picture as well uh, with Peter, because Peter was a very good editor as well. So uh, that was a good, very good relationship. But then, of course, Peter didn't get asked to because he went over budget and he had grand illusions. That he wanted to do Major Barber or something, you know, so quite different to a Bond movie. Uh, so he, we kind of fell out of sync for a while. And then I worked in um, Paris with Louis Gilbert. I did a couple of films there. And uh, one day the uh, phone rang, Cubby Broccoli was coming into town. And uh, he came in and he offered Louis uh, Spy Who Loved Me to direct. And uh, when he came back from lunch with Cubby, uh, Lewis said, oh, he's, uh, Cubby sent his regards and he wants you to do some action stuff on the movie. And uh, the consequence of that was that they sent me out to Baffin Island to do the famous spike, uh, ski parachute jump. And I didn't realise it at the time, but uh, that was the first shot on Cubby's standalone picture. Harry Saltzman had sold out to MGM. 
and uh, when when they, that, I managed to come back with that shot, which cost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in that day and age. Um, Cubby must have secretly said, "This guy, I'm going to watch this guy because he he's produced the goods, you know." And uh, then they sent me out to Sam Moritz to shoot the scene that preceded it with Willie Bogner. And um, I didn't realise it then, but uh, Cubby had already earmarked me for something in the future. I didn't know what. So then we did um, Moonraker, and. Uh, and uh, Lewis said to me, he said, I think this series is running its course, don't you? And I said, I hope not. And then he said, uh, and I got a phone call to come to have lunch with Cubby Broccoli. And I went there, and there were all the key technicians that were on the film, and uh, not much. He would, Cubby wouldn't commit himself. He was going to be the new director, and uh, the special effects guy. He said, what about me? You know, and everyone laughed nervously around the table. Anyway, a week later, I get another phone call, and when I go there, I'm, it's just me and Cubby and uh, Michael Wilson and Dana, his wife, around the table, and I began to suspect something was about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I said to me, would you come back to the office? And when I washed my hands, and went back into the, into the office, and they were sitting, Cubby was sitting at his desk, and they were sitting around, and they were all staring at me. I walked in, and they said, Cubby said, how would you like to direct the next James Bond film? Well, you can imagine how I was affected by that. It came completely out of the blue. That was the last thing I ever expected. So it's like, I suppose it's the equivalent of winning, uh, winning the lottery or something. I don't know, because I've never been that interested in the money side of it. I've never ever sort of said, you know, how much am I going to make out of this? And it's never occurred to me at all. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm on a recce for Few Eyes Only, and Michael Wilson and I are hopping from island to island. And uh, we <coughs> gathered on the rear of this ferry between Greek islands. And he said, I suppose we ought to talk about money. So I said, listen, Michael, I said, I'm going to do this film, whatever you pay me. If you don't pay me anything, I'm doing this film. So I, I put myself in a bit of a disadvantage, money <laughs> uh, but. I probably would have made more money. It's like a two-year assignment, basically, uh, to direct a Bond movie. And uh, I think I got paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I'd probably made as much editing as I did then. But of course, it didn't occur to me then. It, it, that was the least. I mean, I knew that if I made a, had the opportunity uh, and made a success of what I did, the money would take care of itself. You, you don't have to worry about it. Because once you become a successful director. Uh, they throw money at you. I mean, it's absolutely, <laughs> it's absolutely throw money at you. It's amazing. It's like all your, you know, I don't know, dreams come true. But uh, as I say, I never bothered about it. Well, and that started 10 years of big commitment, of five films over 10 years. Um, and you still hold the record for the director who has made the most Bond films, which is worthy of applause. <laughs> Before we get into talking about the, the films a little bit um, more specifically, I want to go back to what you were saying about the action shots and the second director, you know, second unit um, shooting that you did. Because this is the era of practical effects. This is not CGI. So um, I would you tell us a little bit about just, you know, how you had to use the training you had from television, a lot of different, you know, practical long-term um, motion picture tricks in a way to get some of the shots that you got. You still have to prepare the film and the preparation of a movie is the most important part of it. And when I'd finished preparing the movie and we went on the floor, I used to say to myself, the film's made. I've made the film, I've made all those decisions. And from then on, it's a question of just getting through the day and keeping the schedule. Um, and looking at, you know, you get all kinds of problems come up with the actors and what have you. Although I was very lucky, I had Roger Moore. Now, Roger was great. Um, he, initially, he was a bit wary of me, I think, because I'd done lots of films as editor with him, and I think he was not too sure whether I'd make it to become director. I mean, it's quite a big difference, I suppose. But uh, in the end, he came round, and uh, he was wonderful, and uh, his sense of humor was fantastic. Every day, 
you go on the set, it was like, can't wait to get the work, you know, to get a few Rogers gags and, you know, we would allow about half an hour a day for Rogers jokes. And, uh, but he was wonderful and uh, it was a great help to me. This meticulous planning obviously is, you know, 90% of what you um, had to do in order to make sure that things went well, except for you know, onset disasters or, or, or accidents, um, but also all of the locations, the kind of um, global perspective of taking Bond around the world. And you've said in the past this was actually one of the key features is really, um, you know, delivering on um, different locations, an exotic story, all these things. So how did you, as you went through these five films, think about, you know, where would they take place and how did you plan for all those international shoots with so many things that could go wrong? Let's say we have this wonderful backup production crew, you know, that, um, that, you know, you go out to these, Michael and I would go out and we went to Corfu, mm -hmm. and we thought everything in Corfu we could do, you know, for a film. We were still writing the script, I might tell you, at that time. So it was giving us ideas all the time, and uh, uh, I was trying to work out a car chase, and uh, we, we saw the olive pickers, you know, they used nets strung between trees, and they shake the trees down and the, the olives fall into the nets. And I took that in and I thought, hmm, I'll use that in the, in the thing. So but we worked that in the scripts because when you do action scenes, if you can get people involved, it gives you a perspective. You can see the size of everything because it relates to a person. And it's a very basic thing about filmmaking. Um, a lot of fantastic stunts have been done, but they failed because they could be little toys, you know, you don't get any relation to size. So it's essential that you relate to uh, a person. So I always, in my action scenes, I always involve people. Uh, a little bit dangerous at times, but you have to be very careful. Uh, being an editor, of course, gave me an advantage in a sense, because when I storyboarded these action sequences, um, each one was a cut. So I'd have hundreds of drawings all around the room and the, the, the producer would come in, the, the associate producer, and he'd say, I can't believe this, it would take us months to shoot this, you know, so and I said, they're not all separate shots. I said, that's one shot, to, you know, that encompasses, say, six or seven different storyboards. And he couldn't understand that, but uh, that's the way it works. But, you know, you have to, when you're dealing with a big action sequence, you have to photograph, sometimes we photograph the storyboard and we shoot half the sequence and where we haven't, we, instead of putting the missing scene in, we used to photograph the storyboard <laughs> that went between the bits, you know, to join them up. So as you build the scene up. Um, so it's a, a great, great thing uh, to be able to do because when the sun shines and the conditions are perfect, you can do your wide shots. And then when it's raining, you can do your close shots and your inserts. So you keep everyone working, which is important. You can't ever, once they start playing football, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so we are all very lucky that Lewis Gilbert was wrong, that the series wasn't played out and that yeah. it's been going on. But then yeah. that obviously leads to the fact that there have been several different actors. And there's, you know, as um, the decades progress, there will probably be more. Um, you had already a very good relationship with Roger Moore as an editor. Um, you made these three first Bond films with him, and then there was a shift. You, you talk about a little bit about um, the transition to Timothy Dalton, and how were you involved in selecting him? We've done the location records, everything. We've got to shoot on a certain date, and we haven't got a James Bond. So we were all scratching our heads together, and I said, what about Timothy Dalton? He said, well, he, he turned it down a few years ago. I said, yeah, but I don't think life's been exactly, they've not been knocking the door down to sign him up for any films lately. I'm sure he'd be, he'd listen to an offer now. So we had a meeting with him at Michael Wilson's house in Hampstead. And he said, that, you know, he was very interested. And uh, he said that um, if he could make it a harder edge type of bond, he'd be, you know, he'd be very interested in doing it. So we hadn't written, we, we had written the script to a degree, but we then fine-tuned it to accommodate Timothy to his acting, because he was a fat boy, a Shakespearean actor, 
I don't think you have to be a Shakespearean actor to play James Bond, quite honestly, as George Lazenby uh, <laughs> demonstrated. But uh, I think that, um, that you know, it, he is a very good actor, but you need to use his talents as an actor. So we, we did refine quite a bit of the script and uh, try to keep the humour. And we got a very good support actor in Jerome Cap Crabby. And the usual cast, you know, with uh, Desmond Llewellyn play Q, which is always fun. I mean, we, uh, Roger used to, when, when with Roger, he used to rub his hands with glee when, when Desmond Llewellyn <laughs> used to come in for a few days. He, he only used to work for about a week, uh, Desmond Llewellyn, and uh, Roger would just take the mick out of, uh, out of Desmond. Desmond was so straight, you know, he was like, you know, he was... He said, look, I'm supposed to be a, a, a chap that does all this tricky stuff with his hands. He said, he said I'm a gardener. He said, look at my hands. He said, they have these big fingers. <laughs> and, uh, lovely, lovely man. I mean, he was a very good friend of the uh, Shanine's house. He went to all over the world with Desmond. But um, great fun. And I used, to get, uh, I used to get Desmond off the hook sometimes. Um, he'd, he'd rewrite the script for Desmond just before lunch and we were shooting after lunch and he'd write in all these very long words that you can't pronounce you know and uh, I, I, I felt it was a bit cruel actually so uh, I used to devise a way that uh, I'd bring someone in with a, a pad and all the dialogue was written on it and like would you sign this sir you know and then he would speak to all this line was on the pad and he could read it for Desmond's sake I did that so I used to get back to Roger that way but uh, we had such fun on those films, believe me, it was, we worked hard, but uh, it was not hard work if you're enjoying it, is it? So, um, there's a few other crucial casting decisions you always have to make in each of these films. Um, one is your villains, and one is your Bond girls. So, what was your <laughs> philosophy behind um, the different actors that you would seek out for the for the villains let's talk about villains first well yeah the villains i mean we've had some fantastic villains haven't we Bert frobe and, and um what was his name the, 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 in spy love the fantastic german actor whose collection we have here at the That's museum actually he was a fantastic um, plug. He was so smooth, you know. He was so, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, and he, he he was great. And of course, it's a very important important role, the villain in a Bond movie. It's got to be something special. I was very disappointed when I when they used um, the actor. What was his name? But, yeah, Christopher Waltz uh, was used in that film and. Quite honestly, he didn't seem to appear until the end of the movie when it was almost too late, you know. But uh, he did appear in that early scene, but it was photographed so darkly you could, I couldn't really recognise him, you know, I felt. And I thought, if you have an actor like Christopher Waltz, you've got to use him, haven't you? Uh, so it, his part was so underwritten, I thought that was a big mistake. Um, he should have appeared earlier in the movie. Because he was, he, he was on a crest of the wave. Did someone tell me he's doing, he's doing a, he's back in this film, Christopher Waltz, I believe he's back in the new Bond, which is, you know, it's a shame they didn't do it the first one, <laughs> but there you go. And um, what about the Bond girls, and obviously working with two different actors and two different sensibilities, Roger Moore is a little lighter and more comedic. You were trying for, a, you know, a harder edge, as you say, with Timothy Dalton, so how do you cast for that? Well, casting the, the, the lead Bond lady in the film, I'm not using the word Bond girl, although I think everyone else will. Um, apparently it's taboo to say these days Bond oh, girl. I just but, did it, sorry. Uh, yeah, but um, no, I think that it's, it, you go, you have a sort of short list of the top actresses you want. Most of them turn it down because the history of Bond leading ladies isn't good. If you're looking back through the history, not many of them have gone on to do anything else after a Bond film. It's a strange phenomenon, but it's true. Um, you choose a Bond woman mainly because you're looking for someone who can act a bit, 
but it looks fantastic in photographs. Um, that's very important in the Bond movie. Um, so, you know, that was, it was a difficult combination to get a good actress who looks great, photographs well, and wants to do it. <laughs> so it does take a long time. In fact, it's the hardest decision on the movie, who's going to do it. And we go through all the agents in Hollywood, and eventually they, they put people forward for it. But usually it's, it, they're not always the best actresses sometimes, and uh, you have a few problems. I mean, Lewis, not Lewis, um, Roger, Roger Moore, he was like line perfect every time you put the camera on him. He's like straight off take one, take one all the time. He's just absolutely, you know, yeah, photographic memory. Yeah. And um, so what I would have to do is to shoot Roger's stuff first so that he, he could then, because the girl, would say, he, he would take one take and they would take about eight takes in them together <laughs> to break it up in bits and pieces. So I had to do it that way, otherwise poor old Roger would get so brassed off and browned off that he would, um, he would get fed up. So we, we had a, a good arrangement in that sense. But um, no, we had some, we had some very good actresses. Maud Adams was terrific, terrific one. Well, she, she was so good we used her twice. We got stuck. We, we, we couldn't find a Bond girl, uh, a Bond lady, I should say. Um, we couldn't find one. He turned around and he said, he said what's Rob, uh, what's, um, uh, what's her name doing? Uh, what's, Maud, what's Maud doing? Find out which, what she's up to. So she actually appeared in two Bonds, Bond films. In fact, she did make a brief appearance in the third one, but I just kept her and she came to see us and she had to go to go and I got to walk her through the background. Uh, yeah, she was lovely. But, yeah, we, we had some good, good, good ladies. Yeah. And the last kind of signature component I'm going to ask you about is the music and the decision about who, you know, it's always a contemporary you know, musician of that era, um, but having to come up with a theme song that usually includes the name of the movie, um, and then it's presented in this very specific stylized way with this history of um, the title sequences. So how did you make the decisions about which, you know, singers or you know, groups you were going to deal with. You had, the, you know, the music of the 80s, obviously, as the context. Well, the thing is that uh, I think Barbara Broccoli was young enough to be, uh, you know, on the right wavelength about the current state of the pop world, if you like, you know. Uh, I remember she came up with Ha Ha, that group, and uh, she dragged us all the way down to Croydon Empire or something to listen to a concert that they were giving and I mean the, all these young girls were in there screaming their heads off you know with a Freud they would open their mouths and you could hardly hear them sing <laughs> it was such a raucous occasion and uh, I'm afraid that uh, it's not my sort of music and, uh, and, and, uh, I'm a bit too old fashioned I'm a bit Shirley ba Bashish <laughs> you know I like the old ballads and that and Tom Jones and stuff like that so I'm a bit out of date really a bit old fashioned I suppose <laughs> so uh, we left it more or less to Barbara and Cubby to see who would want to do a, a song to start with. And it's quite a complex, it's quite a complex business because you've got to, when most of these artists are signed up with a, an agent who's signed up with a, uh, with a radio uh, corporation of America or somebody, you know, some big thing and you have to negotiate the rights and it gets so complicated and you can spend weeks and weeks trying to find the right person that fits into the all the problems you're going to get so uh, I'm afraid I haven't got the time or the patience to <laughs> go through that so I tended to sidestep that one and we had a couple of disasters uh, where the, the song came in as we were in the dub-in theatre and you know the, and the song always came in very late <laughs> The only exception was Sheena Easton, and that we did. Uh, it was the first time we ever actually showed the artist singing on screen during the titles, which was really nice. Um, but, um, yeah, they come in very late, and uh, if you didn't like the song, it's usually sh uh, recorded in America. In America. And uh, if you didn't like it, 
Shirley Bassey. That's what it was. That was the crime they used to go up quick and Shirley Bassey. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, sometimes I wonder whether I'm trying to think of the actor, the artist who, who, who we threw out. I won't embarrass him, embarrass him by mentioning his name, but uh, the, the sound department at Pinewood, you know, you get the, this eight track score coming from America. They would run it, and it, it's almost as though they made it, try and made it as sound as bad as they could, so that they would prove that they were experts at refining it, you know. But after two runnings, Cubby said, "Get rid of it. We're Shirley Bassey." <laughs> <laughs> so, you have to be ruthless sometimes, but uh, generally, I mean, Marvin Hamlish was fantastic. He, he came over, and. Uh, we, he wanted to play the uh, the theme tune for Spy Who Loved Me. Nobody does it better. And uh, we went over to this theatre tour at Pinewood, which had a, a rather out of tune piano. And Marvin Hamlet Hamlish sat down at the piano and he thumped out uh, Nobody Does It Better and sang it. And he had the most awful, awful voice. <laughs> but it, even with that, it was. I just wish we'd recorded it at that time because it was such a memorable moment. It was such one of the best Bond scores of all, wasn't it? Um, no, um, nobody does it better. It's fantastic. Um, and Marvin, of course, he died a few years ago, but uh, he was a very, very funny man, very talented. Yeah, loved working with him. So we have time for a few questions from the audience. Raise your hand and Urj Puri will bring a microphone. Okay. Oh, down here. <coughs> oh, what do you think, um, what is the funniest joke in your James Bond films? <laughs> <laughs> we used to make a, we used to make a, a Film, uh, yeah, we used to make a film with the bloopers or the mistakes that were made during the film. And um, there was a scene where um, Kurt Jürgens uh, fires a missile under the, this huge Kenan table into Roger Moore's crutch. And uh, the special effects guy was a bit um, trigger happy and Roger was a bit slow jumping out of the chair. And, uh, which finished up with, with Roger running around with his arse on fire <laughs> and uh, afterwards Roger said he said uh, he said I had Vaseline dressings on for two weeks and he said I had two holes where most people had one <laughs> one of Roger's jokes he always made the best out of it but I'm sure it was very painful <laughs> Okay. Yes, up here, please. So my question is, why did uh, Dalton not get his uh, third film? Why did Dalton not get the third, a third Bond yeah. film? Well, he was signed for his third film, um, but there was a delay for some reason. I'm trying to think what it was. He was signed up anyway, so he, he did financially. He did quite well. He got, he got paid, paid off. But uh, the Americans, <clears throat> he didn't do. He wasn't as popular in America, apparently, as he was in Europe and the rest of the world. And the management of MGM was changing all the time. And they were in financial troubles. And one way or another, time it got delayed and what have you, they, they felt they made the decision. Drop Timothy Dalton, drop John Glenn, drop uh, Richard Maybon, drop uh, Michael Wilson. You know, the whole thing was uh, thrown up in the air. And they, I think they probably made the right decision. You know, they, they started again, started fresh. Um, I think I was pretty much drained of any ideas after five, quite honestly. And, you know, there's a limit to, to how inventive you can be, I think. You know, I was a little more prime, I suppose. My imagination was fantastic in those days, and I could come up with these things. But, uh, yeah, it was good. Someone else, some Cubby rang me and he said to me what they'd said and what have you. And I said, oh, I think it's a good idea, Cubby, you know, give a fresh guy a go and see what he can do. He said, well, I don't agree with you, but... Uh, you know, uh, so we've always remained great friends, you know. It's, it's, it's a sort of a divorce, I suppose. 
you know, <laughs> after eight movies together, um, it is a bit of a wrench. Yes, I, I was just wondering, um, I think Lies to Kill is a great movie, but uh, uh, you often say, also in your biography, that you think it is your best movie that you made. Uh, what are your um, argumentation for that? Well, I think it's technically, I suppose, it, I mean, the, the, the truck sequence is probably the, you know, it's such an extensive sequence, such an important part of the film. It's probably half an hour long, you know, and uh, very dangerous work of all those those very big trucks. Uh, Remy Julian's crowd did, did me proud, really. Uh, the chap with the, uh, the, the Frenchman that was rehearsed doing a wheelie with a 10 wheel or 20 wheel truck or whatever yeah. it was for the prime bit of a, yeah. I mean you see wheels done with an ordinary car but you get one of those big trucks yeah. and uh, you know to do a wheelie with that yeah. is, a, is a fantastic bit of driving whichever way you look at it and the, the guy that we, that Remy Julian had trained to do this was supposed to arrive on the appointed day and uh, we were almost giving him up for lost, and uh, he apparently had met a girl on the plane and had gone off, uh, as Frenchmen do, I suppose. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but he did turn up that morning, the same morning we were doing the shot, take one, do it perfectly, and then left, went, presumably went back with the girl again. <laughs> but it was an amazing bit of, uh, not only did he do his wheelie, but he, he Rubbed, he landed the vehicle on top of the, the bed, his yeah. jeep, and smashed that and flattened that on the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a fantastic start. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, how much input did you have in uh, the amount of violence that is, especially in License to Kill? I mean, uh, especially the... Um, sequence in which the, I think Milton Crest was his name, explodes in the pressure chamber, like how many dis discussions did you have about how violent can this get? Well, we kept cutting it down. I mean, we, we, it was a very clever bit of special effects work. We, we did an image of um, Milton Crest's uh, head, which was pneumatic, and we blew it up with a, an air machine, right? So, you know, as the, as the pressure went up in the, in the, whatever it is, the pressure chamber, the head expands and eventually blows up, splatters blood all over the thing. It was, it was pretty horrific, I must say. And uh, the sensor took exception to it as well, even though I'd cut it down. And uh, we did, we, we really reduced it almost to oblivion in the end. And we had to do the same with, the, with the, uh, Robert Darby when he, he gets a total burn. At the end of the film, uh, went to Harvard Burns. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. It's it, it's a kind of a, the drug scene. It's a kind of a very violent subject, and maybe we were wrong to to do it at that time. But it was a, a thing everyone was talking about, and we researched it very closely. And uh, these these <coughs> drug lords were really vicious guys. They, they used to go after people's families and that. So we felt we couldn't really, we had to tell the story as it was, not, not to make it a fairy story, you know. That's that's why we put this sort of bits of violence in, I suppose. But uh, it might have hurt us at the box office a bit, I think, in retrospect. It looks good now, because you can get away with more now, yeah. can't you? Yeah. We have five more questions, we will have them all, and then uh, to finish, but it's the next question. Um, your signature is the use of doves in the films. Where does pigeons. <laughs> uh, pigeons, yes. Where does this come from? They're cheap and they're plentiful. <laughs> <laughs> you can get them anywhere in the world. <laughs> that is basically the truth because you know you get a crate of pigeons and you, you put one, stuff one in a hole in a rock somewhere, and then Roger Moore kind of puts his hand in the, to get a handhold, and a pigeon runs it, it comes out, and Roger Moore almost falls down uh, the depths. You know? And uh, as I say, so it's basically, it became my trademark, but it was basically because they were readily available anywhere on the cheap. That was, that's the truth. <laughs> uh, I have to say, uh, I love Lice to Kill, it's amazing. Uh, what would you say to the future filmmakers about action, how how they should kind of 
look at it nowadays and what, what are your tips for action directors nowadays? It's a difficult question really because with CGI, that you can do anything with CGI, it just costs money and takes time. Uh, it's taken a lot of the enjoyment out of it for the director because a lot of the, the finesse is out of his hands because it goes to some, goes to India or wherever they do it, you know, and uh, it's, um, it's really not quite, I mean, we used to like to see our stuff the next morning and um, do it for real. And I'm not sure that C CGI, I mean, they use it on a lot of things now. And my son's a CGI editor and a visual effects editor. And he says on Harry Potter they were putting 150 elements, extra elements, into each shot. You know, oh. Owls flying this way and that way. You can do anything with it. But it's taken a lot of the skill out of the actual shooting crew, you know. How, how you devise how to do the scene. I mean, you know, there's tricks that the Keystone cops used to do, you know. I always remember the, the truck, uh, the, the car with four guys in there crossing the railway line in front of the locomotive. And uh, we used to wonder how that was done. And apparently they used to, they used to tow, the locomotive used to tow the car through a series of pulleys so that it was timed so it was that close. Uh, on uh, colliding with the, with the train and those sort of things that you know you, you do like the foreground miniatures we used to use uh, on Octopussy the foreground miniatures of going into the hangar uh, they're, they're so easy to do as long as your first unit's not doing it it's just definitely a second unit job because they might spend two weeks setting up and getting it absolutely right but you couldn't afford to do it with the first unit, not with 150 people, you know. But a smaller unit can do it. And uh, I think that that's quite a... If you look at Octopus and you look at that uh, pre-titled sequence, which has nothing to do with the film whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, it's about an eight or nine minute sequence. It's like a, a second feature used to be, you know, on a movie. And uh, I came up with it. I, you know, we were desperate to try and find it. Um, a, a pre-title sequence and Covey said, looked at me he said you better think of something to do and I sort of toyed around with an idea and we were still writing the script so I had no idea really exactly how, what way the script would work so I just wrote this as a bit of a you know just played around with it and, uh, and in the end that was the best they could find so they we shot it that way but it was quite a good sequence but I, I would rather it have been something to do with the movie. <laughs> but the Beady Jet, we, one of the main reasons we did that was because Peter Lamont said to me, he said, I've got three Beady Jets in the hangar, which we made for Moonraker and didn't ever use. <laughs> so he said, they're there, you know, ready to use. So that got me thinking, that's how we, we eventually, you know, economic, economic is coming to it a, a great deal, how much it costs, things cost. Yeah. Um, the score of uh, License to Kill from, from Michael Kamen has a, like um, the I Heart and Lisa Weapon touch. Was it your idea or the producer's or Michael Kamen's direction? I think Michael Kamen actually. I wasn't that impressed yeah. with Michael Kamen uh, initially because I, I, he lived in uh, Nottingham Hill in London and uh, I went down to see him. and talk about the score he was doing, etc. And when I arrived there, he got this, the, all these kids in the house, you know, his own children and other children. And he kept going off to do something for the children. And I, felt I wasn't getting the right amount of attention, quite honestly. But um, on retrospect, he had, it was a very good score. It was traditional, a traditional Bond score, I would say, but it's not bad. It's quite good. Um, I think you could say the same thing about Mark, uh, Arnold, David Arnold's scores. They're, they're a little bit John Barry-ish, aren't they, in uh, a lot of ways. Um, but th it is a style of music you get on the Bond movies, uh, very dramatic. And, uh, yeah, I, I thought he did a pretty good job, actually. Here's the next question. Well, I would be interested in the thing or something you remember from all five movies that you enjoyed the most of making the films. 
Ah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I'm, I have to say that uh, I did enjoy every movie very much, and uh, uh, I couldn't wait to get to work every day. It was, it was, it was, it was such the, the crew and everything, particularly the ones with Roger Moore. Um, I think probably the scenes we used to do with Desmond Llewellyn, who played Q, that was something we all used to look forward to with, with Desmond to come on the set. He was, he was such a straight man. He was like, you know, he wasn't uh, at all technical. And, uh, you know, he, he, he couldn't uh, remember his lines. He was getting quite old. He was getting as bad as me. And, uh, he, 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 you know, we'd have to put idiot boards up and uh, stamp lines on the other actors. <laughs> um, on one occasion, we were doing a scene with Timothy Dalton. It was, I think it must have been Living Daylights. And um, we had a scene where uh, we had to put gas masks on while Q demonstrated uh, the snow of gas. Right. So <laughs> Desmond puts his gas mask on and uh, Timothy does, and, and they do the experiment. And then Timothy takes his gas mask off, and I said, "No, no, Desmond, keep yours on, because we can put the lines over." You see, so they just move, just move your mouth. We can put any lines over. So uh, that's what we did. That's how we got through the scene. Uh, that was quite amusing. Timothy didn't think it was amusing. He couldn't believe it. he'd never seen anything like it working with an actor. He was mumbling and moving his without replying. <laughs> But uh, I think he got used to us after a while. <laughs> yes, our last question. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, thanks for taking my question. I have a question about License to Kill, uh, specifically Benicio del Toro. Uh, we all know what he wanted to become in the film industry. Can you talk about what the thought process was, although it was a supporting role, the thought process between uh, securing him for that film? Thank you. Um, who did you say? Oh, Benicio del Toro. Yeah, he was. Um, he was. It was. It was an idea of Barbara. She. She knew him from Hollywood. Uh, he played. Had a small part in a film, and she was very impressed with him. And she recommended him. And I wanted a younger person to play the sort of second villain. And um, he, he was a bit off the wall, Benicio. He was a very sort of way out type of actor, you know. And. Uh, but very effective, you know, he was a sort of a modern actor, you know, he, he was a bit methody, I suppose. But uh, unfortunately, um, we had an accident, we were doing the scene where um, uh, the, the machine that used to cut up the, the dope or whatever it was, was running and uh, Tim, Tim Dalton is having a fight with Benicio on the, on the thing and during the fight, um, Tim got his hand badly cut by Benicio, who wasn't very disciplined, you know what I mean? And also, we were using a real knife because it has to glint and what have you. You know, you can't use a rubber knife very well. And unfortunately, uh, Tim got cut quite badly and tanked to the dressing room. While the ambulance was coming, the assistant said to me, he said, uh, he said, what are we going to do about uh, carrying on? So I said, yeah, well, get, get, go to Tim and get him to give us his ring and the stuff that was on his cut hand, you know, his watch and all that stuff. And I'll uh, use a double and carry on shooting because you have to carry on. So he, he looked at me for a second and he said, no, you're going to have to do it. <laughs> he wouldn't want to face Tim and that. So I had to go into Tim's dressing room. And uh, I said to Tim, can I have all your jewellery and stuff? And Tim looked at me and he gave me a wry smile. <laughs> he thought <laughs> no one would want to ask him to do that. So I got all this stuff and put it on the double when we carried on shooting. And Tim went off to hospital and got stitched up. And, and then he came back very shortly afterwards and uh, he was fine. But he was, he was quite brave, I must admit. But uh, Benicia was a bit of a bit of a wild card really, but he's good, you know, he's unusual. And uh, well, he went on to get an Oscar for Best Supporting Act mm -hmm. a couple of films later. So it was quite a good choice on Barbara's part. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you all for the questions and thank you, John Glenn, for coming to see us here in Frankfurt and spending the evening with us. So
to have heard so much about his works, we have a uh, special trailer with four minutes of your works put together by a member of the James Bond Club in Deutschland. It's a great thing to have it here. We would show it before the film starts, License to Kill, 30 years after, and we have a 35 millimeter original print from our own archive. It's really magnificent to watch it, not digitally, in the analog way, in the way John Glenn shot it. So enjoy this evening. See you.